It is customary to begin an introduction with a formulaic, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. But after reading our speaker this <laughs> evening's book, Seder Square, I can, can't quite bring myself to say that. It is a book that gives pleasure, and there's no way introducing its author can rival that pleasure. <laughs> I will get to that book soon, and there are also copies of it in the foyer there. But let me begin with the professional details, and they are as impressive as they get. Leonard Barkin is presently Arthur W. Marks' 1919 Professor of Comparative Literature and Director of the Society of Fellows at Princeton University. He is also a Fellow of the New York Institute for the Humanities and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has taught at Northwestern University, University of Michigan, and New York University before in 2001, uh, settling into his position at Princeton. <clears throat> He's written four major books on Renaissance culture, particularly the fine arts and literature, uh, and particularly of Italy and England. And I will name them, since each has a descriptive title, a rare and welcome thing in an academic book. And together they give a sense of the rich range of his scholarship and imagination. There's nature's work of art, the human body, as image of the world, Yale, 1975, the gods made flesh, Metamorphosis and the Pursuit of Paganism, Yale, 1990, Transmuting Passion, Ganymedian the Erotics of Humanism, Stanford, 1991, and most recently, uh, Unearthing the Past, Archaeology and Aesthetics in the Making of Renaissance Culture, Yale, 2001. And I'll be saying a little bit more about that book than the others because it is for that book that he was received this sabbatical uh, during which he did, uh, he was researching that book uh, <clears throat> during the year that the memoir is about. Together these books have garnered a number of prizes, uh, including the Christian Gauss Award uh, that was received both by the Gods Made Flesh in 1990 and then 10 years later for Unearthing the Past. And he is the uh, only author to have twice received this uh, high literary prize. He's also written many other essays, too many to mention, though I can't resist mentioning one exquisite essay that he wrote for a volume that I co-edited, a rather otherwise lackluster volume I think of essays about Shakespeare. It was in a Shakespeare companion, um, but his was truly uh, exquisite. Put the rest of the book to shame. to that, uh, he made a wonderful point, which is that if you want to know Shakespeare, uh, don't seek out the facts of his life, reconstruct his library. So it was on Shakespeare's reading. <clears throat> As a Renaissance scholar, and Leonard is so very much more, but he, uh, his own career says a great deal about the state of the discipline over the past generation. Sometime after 1980, and this will be more familiar to some of you than others, Renaissance studies, particularly in English, underwent a sea change. To begin with, it was renamed the Early Modern Period, and the shift in title indicated a decided shift in focus. The dominant approach in the period, and I'll name it, New Historicism, virtually lost all interest in antiquity. <clears throat> valuing the period, say 1400 to 1600 approximately, less as a rebirth of Renaissance, of antiquity, <clears throat> than as the start of modernity. Leonard, however, held the course, <laughs> one of the few I know who did, never lost his focus on how this period brought antiquity to life and itself in the process. Unearthing the past is about the emergence of ancient works of art, literally from the ground of Rome, and the immediate impulse to bring them back to life through representation, both visual and textual. Um, and one of the outstanding um, descriptions in the book is of the discovery of the Laocoon in Rome in 1506. Um, uh, an account that is based on an eyewitness report who says as soon as the statue was visible, as soon as it was removed from the ground, everyone started to draw it, all the while discoursing on ancient things. It was an incredible stimulus of, of the uh, discovery of objects of art in the earth. 
It is in no small part because of Leonard's work, particularly in unearthing the past, that attention in the field is starting to veer back to the ancient world, but with a decided difference, a new inflection on the material remains of the past, on how they are lost and retrieved, often in bits and pieces, and then constellated anew. That a personal memoir should have emerged the same year in which he was researching this book on the recovery of our cultural past seems nothing short of marvelous. I read Seder Square when I happened to be teaching an essay by Montaigne entitled On the Affection of Fathers for Their Children. In concluding, Montaigne changes the subject to affection of authors for their books, <clears throat> for what they propagate from their souls rather than their bodies. He follows with a long list of authors, ancient and modern, whose affection for their books exceeds that for their children. <laughs> but he also considers the love of readers for the books they love. <clears throat> Says Montaigne, there are few readers who would not more gladly endure the loss of their son than of the Aeneid. <laughs> that may be extreme, but I'll end where I began by saying that Sayer Square is indeed a book to love, and please join me in welcoming its author, Leonard Barkin, who will be reading from that book. Thank you. Uh, in, in my business, you go around uh, quite a bit and give papers and read in many places, and I realized as I was sitting there um, that the two most wonderful introductions I have ever had were uh, on this campus and by the same person. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you, Margaret, and, and I hope you will, you do or will love Sacred Square, but no need to uh, prefer it to your children. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it seems as though what I'm going to do today is give you a little bit of a, a prologue to the book and then read several, uh, read you a little travel, uh, travelogue through it. Um, by way of prologue, then, uh, it seems as though every book has two stories the story that the book tells and the story about how the book got written. I'll be reading some excerpts this afternoon from, from my recently published memoir, Set of Squares, a year, subtitled A Year in Life, a Life in Rome, which is part literary criticism, part aesthetic and culinary travelogue, part love story. In fact, Sater Square is itself the story of how a different book got written, as Margareta has, has told us, a book called Unearthing the Past, which is much more in the mold of my usual scholarly production. I came to Rome on a year's sabbatical, quite a long time ago now, to research the rediscovery of ancient sculpture in the Renaissance. I had visited the city many times previously, but only as a briefly wayfaring tourist. Upon my arrival that September, I knew not a living soul in the city. I had no connections to any institution, uh, and my command of Italian was none of the best. Ten months later, when I left for the States, I had a farewell party where some 40 or 50 people gathered to eat and drink with me. That's the plot of the book in a nutshell. What transformations took place as I fell in love with Rome? Rome, to some extent, fell in love with me, and most of all, I fell in love. So that's the book, story the book tells. But it seemed necessary for me as a professor of comparative literature and art history, who normally writes intricate historical tomes whose footnotes occupy a third of the page span, to say a little about how something so different got written. Because I hate thinking of myself as just another memoirist, part of what my friend uh, Amy Hempel calls the memoir industry. Uh, I insist on locating the origins of Seder Square in some very particular personal encounters. Eight years ago, André Asiman, friend and master memoirist to say the least himself, asked me if I would give a talk in a series at the New York Public Library on love. His one admonition was, don't be academic. And he wielded this axe through uh, countless rejections of topics I suggested, <laughs> even the one about which I believe I lectured on at Penn uh, a few years ago about the statue of Venus that has uh, a semen stain on it. Even that, he thought, was too academic. <laughs> uh, uh, finally, um, uh, I said that during these long months of discussions, I had actually fallen in love. Talk about that, he said. And to my surprise, I discovered that that particular love affair, which has as much to do with poetry as with passion, maybe more, uh, we won't go there, uh, was indeed a suitable subject. 
with the encouragement of other writer friends, including the person with whom I had fallen in love even after the affair was over, I began to realize that my academic and artistic interests, even if they're most scholarly, had in their own way been love affairs. And it took only a small shift of perspective, a little more emphasis on the person observing the beauty and a little less on the beauty itself, for me to write this story as a love affair with culture. Then, as I began to reflect on the time in Rome, I realized that the passions that had inspired me in and around the Casa di Sateri, aka Center Square, were not only intellectual and not only erotic, but also, most of all, gastronomic. Indeed, the secret of my acceptance in Rome was finding the right people with whom to share food and wine. What I've tried to do is to tell all of these stories as one story. So Center Square is a book about Italy and a book about me, but also a book about Shakespeare and Mozart, about Raphael and Caravaggio, about eggplant antipasto and Brunello di Montalcino, about foot fetishism and sulfur baths. Or as I told the publisher when I was asked for a pithy description, I said, call it Sideways meets Edmund White under the Roman sun, the whole thing catered by MFK Fisher. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get through all of that. Uh, I have to say something so that you will read the whole book and buy it outside, preferably, to all your friends. Uh, um, but I hope you, you get uh, a little of the book's uh, highly composite flavor this afternoon. And as I say, I'm going to read... Um, I'm going to, the, the plot of the book is that I, at the beginning I know nobody, and at the end I know everybody. Um, and we'll see a little bit of that progress, and I will read a little bit from each of the three major chapters and give you, when needed, uh, a bit of, uh, as I say, a bit of a triptych uh, to get from one part to the next. <clears throat> so um, we begin at the very uh, beginning of my life in Rome that year, uh, near the beginning of the time that I live in the uh, eponymous uh, place. There were 103 steps up to my top floor apartment in the Piazza di Sacchi. They rose in a long stone spiral, said to have functioned as a military watchtower for several centuries before the building it now served was constructed as an afterthought to it. At this moment, within days of my arrival, I had, yet, I had not yet counted the steps, of course. That act of classification would only come months later, born of a cross between exhilaration and muscle strain, as I hefted home the complete works of Pliny the Elder, or else of my determination to master the strains of life in Rome, perhaps inspired by notable success or failure in the archives. The steps were innumerable, and the memory of hauling upward a taxi full of excess baggage still fresh. I had mastered nothing about the route homeward, except that the man who drove me from the airport, after gamely consenting to help with the suitcases once he was ticked in Lira sporting many zeros, had taught me a new vocabulary word. As we wheezed our way upward, he gave me to understand that we were passing one, two, three, four, and arriving finally at my fifth, pianerottolo, or landing. Eager to increase my word power, I had just tried this expression out on a friendly shopkeeper. I was choosing between the purchase of a TV and the rental of a piano, the one project ultimately postponed, the other abandoned. But where I expected to impress with my conquest of domestic Italian, I was faced rather with philological comeuppance. Yes, he said, you could uh, uh, describe the place, the space in front of my door that way, but mostly the word was used to talk about neighborly proximity to establish your bond with the people next door by saying that they lived on the same pianerotto. Like so many words, it seemed to describe a thing, but really described a relation. My building, an accidental composite, now rather dilapidated, of separate constructions from the 1st, 11th, and 17th centuries, had only one apartment per floor. Without a close neighbor, I could have no pianerotto. Perhaps it was the conversation with the piano man that inspired the tiny act of madness I was about to commit on this upward climb. Then too it was dark, the staircase would never be well lit, and I was as yet so far from having a Roman routine that I had, had not yet even learned to count landings, let alone steps. At all events, on this particular afternoon, I found myself well above street level, in front of a door inside my building, poised to enter. Why I did not simply extract the keys from my pocket, I am not sure. It can't have been that I forgot about them. Their boxy, exotic shapes produced a vexing bulge in my clothing that I never learned to smooth. Let us just say, and not for the last time, that I was slightly disoriented. What I did was, I knocked on my own door. <laughs> A voice responded, Qui est? 
who's there? And I said, Sonio, it's me. A completely unremarkable exchange. Except that there was no one in my apartment. There could be no one in my apartment. In my whole adult life, I had lived with no one. Furthermore, it was especially impossible for there to be anyone in this apartment, since I knew not a living soul when I came to Rome, nor had I, since my arrival, met anyone to whom, judiciously or injudiciously, I might have offered a set of those cumbersome keys. I had exchanged a life without a partnership for a life without even an acquaintanceship. The mystery, I suppose, is not much of a mystery. I was intruding on the siesta of the elderly lady who lived at the fourth rather than the fifth pianerotto. No surprise that she would react to a stranger by asking, who's there? But whom did I think I was talking to when I replied, it's me? <laughs> and what was I to say when she very reasonably responded, me who? <laughs> I covered my tracks by blurting out some hastily concocted form of, please excuse me, I've made a mistake, I'm at the wrong door. O sbagliato porta, o sbagliato porta, I repeated to myself upstairs after consulting dictionaries and phrase books, though I never again needed to say it. And from then on, I learned that to get home in the Piazza dei Santeri, I had to climb until there were no more neighbors and no more stairs to climb. We go on, the, as I say, each, each chapter finds me a little bit, each of the three chapters finds me a little bit, with a little bit more society. Until the end, we have a little bit too much society. Uh, but uh, I'm going to read, um, I guess it's just uh, uh, one segment. Um, no, a couple of segments. I <laughs> can't quite remember. Uh, it'll all be clear when I get there. Um, from the second chapter, the first chapter, I should say the titles of the chapters tell you a little bit about them. The first chapter is called um, uh, One Year of Solitude. Uh, and the second chapter, uh, from which I'm now reading, uh, in which, which is uh, very much based on my relationship to Don Giovanni, my relationship and, and, uh, and non-relationship to Don Giovanni, although we won't hear so much about that, um, uh, that part of the chapter. But that chapter is called, for obvious reasons, if you know Don Giovanni, it's called Inviting the Statue to Dinner. Um, and the last chapter in which I have so much society is called The Communist Gourmet Club, but we'll get to The Communist Gourmet Club in a while. Uh, this is one of the earlier phases of inviting the statue to dinner in a state of just beginning to have a society. When I finally coaxed myself uh, out of contemplation and into action, my first encounter had to be with the Spinario. This naked little bronze guy, sculpted 2,000 years ago and famous ever since, sits on a rock, left leg crossed over right knee, and hunches over intently while working with both hands to extract a thorn from his upturned foot. That's all there is. Nothing mighty or monumental, nor even particularly beautiful. Just a three-foot-high kid doing a little self-surgery. Poring over the Spinario archive at a Herziana library table, all I developed were more questions. Statues represent gods or heroes. Mere mortals deserve sculpting only when in torment or ecstasy. There is no god of thorn pulling. Inflammation of the soul is not a tragedy. I knew that for centuries people had tried to flatten these dilemmas by inventing names and narratives for this kid. He was the beautiful Absalom from the book of Samuel. He was the month of March. He was a young Roman who ran for miles with aching foot to carry a message to the Senate. He was an allegory of penance. No, my instinct told me that he was just a boy with a thorn. But what was the purpose of a boy with a thorn, and why were we also taken with him? The answer could come only from seeing him face to face in the Capitoline collection. Courtesy of an English acquaintance, I was invited to a reception one Sunday morning. It was just right for killing an hour before the museum opened. Wherever I moved through the grand top floor apartment among many hallways and strangers, dodging offers of mediocre bubbly and oversweetened pastries, I kept noticing the same young man, though he always seemed to be facing away. After various sightings, I started to get a composite of him, rather small but with extraordinarily large hands, a closely cut round head of red blonde hair and a beard to match, dressed with an incongruous elegance, black check jacket and trousers not quite matching, one tweedy and one shiny, a starched white shirt and a florid bow tie. Could there have been a pince nez? Everything slightly out of place or out of time. I was about to leave, not disgracefully early, with a bare sense that I had done my duty, spoken to quite a few people, exercised my Italian, run the gamut of party topics. In the act of bidding farewell to the hostess, however, I found myself mentioning that I'd heard she had paintings in the apartment and I asked if I could see them. Suddenly, at the mention of pictures, the young man materialized as my guide. Taking me by the hand, he led me to the study, 
a lush, badly drawn Caravaggesque Madonna, so shiny that it looked as if it had been painted yesterday. And then the master bedroom, something after, long after, Tiepolo. He was so proprietary that I thought perhaps he owned the apartment. He certainly owned something. At the foot of the canopy bed, he turned to our hostess with a gracious and old-fashioned gesture, and said he could not go on talking to me without a proper introduction. When she complied, he executed a bow. Suddenly, his whole costume looked Victorian, pre-Raphaelite. Gabriele and I were together, alone. Marina tells me that you are a very intelligent man. That's all I know, she said. But he seemed to know about my research. And he went on with what might have been a poem or a song concerning his own work, something Byzantine. But whether he was an artist or an art historian, I, I couldn't make out. He was then pulled away by someone who said it was time to go, that after all, they would all see each other later at dinner. I was ready to try anything so that I would be ensued an invitation to this dinner. Now, as we were the last guests in the immense foyer, he leaned across the exit door, and eyes twinkling into mine began the long wind-up to some great pronouncement. I don't want you to think I'm just saying this, and I hope I'm not being too bold, but I thought he was going to tell me he was falling in love with me. It was not impossible. <laughs> How does it happen that Jews are more intelligent than other people? <laughs> <laughs> Then he added, more likely corrected himself, or more amusing. <coughs> he whirled around and was suddenly halfway down the stairs. From the next landing, I heard him shout up to me, Ci vediamo presto a cena. See you soon at dinner. In later years, the accessibility of the Spinario turned into a long-running tragic comedy in my life. I had only to show my face in the capital line, and either that single gallery was closed, the museum was under massive reconstruction, where the entire complex was brilliantly reopened in a gorgeous new installation, but this one statue was temporarily shipped off to Paris and replaced by a little framed picture. But this time I had beginner's luck. Yeah. There he was, strangely off-center in the gallery, atop a squat marble column. Photographs had not prepared me for how he was miniature and yet life-size at the same time. How his strangely elegant coiffure stayed upright even though he was bent over. How the flecked patina of the bronze looked at once like the, flat, like the flesh of a child and the husk of something infinitely aged. But truth to tell, all of that came only after a while. What struck me first, indeed I was thrilled and disturbed and almost burst out laughing, was the discovery that this scenario is exhibited on a turntable. At either side of the bronze, of the bronze platform on which this child's 2,000-year-old foot is resting, Museum visitors have at their disposal two little brass erections, enabling them to spin the whole construction around at will, as though it were a ship's wheel or a game of chance. Alone with a rotating art object, I took control of the tillers. <laughs> Instantly, of course, I realized what no picture can reveal. This scenario was 360 degrees of beauty. From the front, he is a piece of complex right-angled topology, with the cross of his legs balanced by the oblique angles of his arms above. A quarter turn in one direction, he has a human arc, face and foot hunkered in a tight sea climb. A quarter turn in the other direction, and the space at his center opens up so that we see into the embrace of his arms and the focal point of a wound whose invisibility, since no thorn mars the burnished bronze of his soul, lures the viewer into a deeper enigma. Finally, I executed the last quarter turn, which revealed a pure abstraction of line and curve that is also an irresistibly molded back continuing into the beginnings of a cleft between the boys' buttocks. That was enough museum for one afternoon. Besides, I had a dinner date. In the big, noisy trattoria, it took careful, passive-aggressive behavior on my part to ensure that I would be sitting face-to-face -face with Gabriele, rather than sit down randomly among the university chums who made up most of the company. At one point, he was explaining the importance of tree-of-life diagrams in Persian art. When a fellow farther down the table a sweet-faced man, who probably came closest to being my age, said quite seriously, So you don't work for the post office? <laughs> Gabriele leaned over confidentially to me and said, It takes so long to explain what he does that he's in the habit of saying he works for some branch of the civil service, a different one each day of the week. Sunday he delivered the mail. The revelation that he had recently gotten a driver's license produced an art show of identity cards sporting various photographs of Gabriele. Passing them around in one direction, while dessert was being passed in the other, he shouted out captions for all of them. One, in which he was very serious but had a maze of tangled hair, was Giovane Comunista. In another, looking bewildered inside some sort of floppy parka, he was Nevrotico Paracadutista. A third, shot from a low angle, so that one looked, up at, uh, looked at him up the line of his raincoat, was Famigerato Onanista. 
It's not too many. Italians speak Czech. Uh, young communist, neurotic parachutist, notorious masturbator. I couldn't get enough of these rhymes. Now all I had to do was snaffle him loose from his uh, riotous companions. I started to understand something about the lure of the Spinario. Of course he had no name and no story. How do you make an icon out of a thorn puller when the thorn isn't even there? The boy focuses so intently on his foot, but the sculptor refuses him even the defect of a break in the skin. The Spinario has no reason, no meaning, no purpose except to be beautiful. If he is sexy, if you crave him, it's not because he is a hot boy who happens to be made of metal, it's because perfect shape makes perfect desire. Dinner, finally, at my apartment, just the two of us. Things are not going well. Instead of hilarious anecdotes and knowing glances eye to eye, I am treated to a cultural monologue. He has racial theories, and in his life there are so many races. Jews and Armenians, Turks and Greeks, all can be explained by their nationality. He's contemptuous of the English language. Uh, how stupid that the present tense of the verb is go and the past tense is went. He hates all modern literature, particularly anything written by women. I had barely started to put out olives and breadsticks when he announces that his girlfriend is going to join us directly. Non ti dispiace? It displeases me mightily, but all I can think of for the moment is the terrible gaffe of my menu. For antipasto, I have made two artichokes a la romana, braised, flavored with Roman mint, each served with its stem provocatively upright. For first course, two individual lasagnas layered, layered with wild mushrooms inside ramekins. For main course, two butterfly medallions of pork tenderloin done slightly sweet with diced carrots and beets. Everything in pairs. It's a Noah's Ark of feasts. <laughs> and I've been that obvious in my menu planning without realizing it myself. And how could any of these twos be turned into threes? The graver problem is that I don't have the Italian to deal with this. I cannot summon understatement, indirection, implication, irony. I don't have the conditionals and the subjunctives for it. I would love to invite, what might her name be, Anna Maria, if it were feasible, as if I could it possibly. I'm left with saying, no, she can't come. <laughs> he makes a phone call, determined sullenly that he will join her after dinner. The banquet must, however, go on. And somehow my Italian becomes just sufficient to fight back on his theories of civilization. He is a Catholic Italian, and I'm a Jewish American, but that hardly proves anything, I spot. And besides that, some of my favorite writers are 20th century women. While polishing off every morsel of food, with some uh, very pretty compliments, it must be admitted, Gabriele grabs a sheet of my note paper, pulls a red felt-tip marker from his pocket, and starts to sketch. Two bulbous interlocked human forms begin to emerge out of a single pen stroke. On the left, a more petite figure, his circular head described by ringlets and topped with a wide-brimmed clerical hat worn in a jaunty slant. On the right, a more corpulent personage with an earnest, angular face, his jagged wisps of hair parted by the simple curvature of a skullcap. Both seem enveloped in robes, both are bespectacled, but there is a suggestion of decisive stylistic difference in these accoutrements. Above the drawing, which is finished in moments, he writes, the rabbi and the Jesuit argue about Virginia Woolf. <laughs> we both go silent. I leave dessert in the refrigerator, two chocolate truffles. I have forgotten my sociological counterclaims. I've stopped worrying about Anna Maria. I begin to fall in love with this double image of two men who are made so intimately out of a single um, line. Gabriele looks at me, looking at the drawing, and promises that he will execute a proper painting of this subject, and he will present it to me very soon as a gift. With that, he goes off to his rendezvous. I'm satisfied. We're going to have a second date. Mm -hmm. I spend research time in my apartment going through the many artworks in which the Spinario is quoted. From about 1400 to 1600, he is everywhere, like some pre-modern zelig. But he's not just lurking in the back of a crowd. When Brunelleschi tries to win the commission for the Florentine baptistry doors, a bent-over boy with his upside-down foot in the air takes up as much space as Isaac being sacrificed by Abraham. When the first frescoes de decorate the Sistine Chapel decades before Michelangelo, in one picture, a cross-legged mus muscle man seated on a stump upstages Moses, and in another, a slenderer youth in the same posture lures attention away from Christ being baptized. And is it a joke that Signorelli's Madonna and Child share their landscape with a naked spinario who's as big as a cliff? Long silence from Gabriele. I interrogate our few mutual acquaintances when I run into them. Some say he's in Milan, Others say he's in Kabul. Once in front of the fresh wild mushroom stand in the Campo dei Fiori, I encountered the hostess who introduced us and released into English 
I discreetly vent my disappointment, focusing on not having received the promised canvas. She says she hasn't heard from him in ages. But can it be a coincidence? The very next day, I find a strange document loose in my letterbox, a little folded piece of paper with a legend all in caps. I give my word of honor that I will paint for Leonard Barkin, resident in Piazza de Sacri, one, one, painting depicting rabbi and Jesuit. It is signed in script, the Jesuit, and the signer is represented with a tiny profile self-portrait, wearing what has become a fleshed-out form of the identifying headgear, now a sort of clerical sombrero. So he does deliver the mail, after all, <laughs> but little else. More time goes by, and one quite quiet evening in Sater Square, my doorbell rings. Looking out the window, I can make out in the twilight a familiar figure, now hatless. He waves and screams, no, no, you have to come down. In the piazza, I realize that he's standing by a car with the motor running. A young woman is sitting in the passenger seat. He hands me a sizable wrapped package, smiles radiantly at me, and says, ci vediamo presto. See you soon. Upstairs, I unwrap the picture. There, in the lower right-hand corner, stand the two figures, as in the sketch. Now, of course, they are multicolored. The Jesuit in a black gown, belted, hatted, beringed, and coiffed all in identical crimson. The rabbi, gray in hair and robes, Gabriele has no idea how to dress a rabbi. <laughs> the Jesuit, who's wearing a, who is wearing a pants name, gazes into a vague middle distance. The rabbi looks distractedly upward. I think of Aristotle and Plato in the School of Athens. <laughs> of course, these two are no longer made of a single line, and they are dwarfed by a large expanse painted in beautiful sea blue green. Most strangely of all, the empty spaces are entirely covered with Greek writing, first in horizontal lines and then lower down, winding in snaky coils around the rabbi and the Jesuit. <clears throat> I have always been embarrassed by how little Greek I know. I find myself resenting this intrusion into our double portrait and I start wondering how I am going to transport this two-by-three-foot object back to America when the time comes. Still, I did manage to bring the painting back to America with me. I hung it in a succession of different houses, always in the same location, over the toilet. No disrespect intended, hard as that may be to believe. Perhaps it was the bright colors, or the half-childlike, half-medieval painting style, or the sense that there was something a little arcane and narcissistic about it that relegated it to such a private spot yet one where it could be regularly contemplated. Many years into this installation, I hosted a dinner party that included a Greek colleague. After having excused himself from the table, he returned with a beatific and patriotic smile, <laughs> saying, I love this house. It has Kavafi in the bathroom. <laughs> Only now did I discover that my painting contained a complete poetic artifact, a lyric entitled On Board Ship, Two hours of conversation with my colleague about these 12 lines mostly told me how many ineffable meanings lurked in the poem's vocabulary, how impossible it was, in short, for me to comprehend it in my own language. I would never quite be able to understand in what way Cavafy was imagining a remembered sketch of a beautiful boy, whether the beauty was real, recollected, or painted. Mere English could never construe the many meanings of aesthetikos, beautiful, sensual, sickly. And what fool would even begin to tackle psyche or pathos? Still, in recognition of a long ago acquaintanceship, of a sketch, a contract, of brightly colored memories of things out of time and out of place, and of a mutual love of images that do not fade while bodies and memories do, I transcribe these lines, Kavafi's voice, rendered in my own vernacular. <clears throat> it's like him, of course, this little pencil portrait, hurriedly sketched on the ship's deck, the afternoon magical, the Ionian sea around us. It's like him. But I remember him as better looking. He was almost pathologically sensitive, and this highlighted his expression. He reveals himself more beautiful now that my soul brings him back out of time. Out of time, all these things are very old. The sketch, the ship, the afternoon. So, Gabriele's message in a bottle finally washed up on my shore 15 years later. Uh, part of the adventure, uh, uh, we're still in inviting the statue. Part of the adventure, of course, is language, as I've already implied. My Italian is bumpy, 
largely based on, uh, that's the reason Don Giovanni figures in the book, is that I, all the Italian I knew came from having memorized Don Giovanni as a freshman at Swarthmore. Uh, the only record I had, I played it 1,100 times. And I knew it by heart, uh, though I didn't always know what it meant. I can, and I can still more or less sing it from beginning to end. Um, uh, so hence, of course, the title of the chapter. Um, and this is a segment about language and, and uh, learning language. <coughs> I knew something about life as a language lab. I should say that I, uh, I was able to do this because I worked in the Swarthmore language lab uh, doing French and, uh, French and German uh, tutorials. Um, uh, I knew something about living life as a language lab. It was no surprise to me, making my way through Primo Levi's periodic table in those months, that the first chemical element in his table of contents turns quickly into a portrait of his family via the Jewish dialects that they spoke. I knew nothing about the Sistema Periodico when I chose it as a, as a language workbook, and so I was unprepared for lesson one, uh, the book's epi epigraph, which I quote. Ibab Yakub in the is good to show. Under it. E bello raccontare i guai passati. Those are not in the same language. Um, for Levi, a proverb cited in a far off East European patois, italically transliterated, it's good to remember past troubles serves as a fanciful entryway <clears throat> to the experience of the Piedmontese diaspora, which he goes on to quote in a vernacular of elaborately spelled out sentences containing almost nothing recognizable as Italian. But to me, that foreign phrase was the least exotic part of the book, owing to my own version of the linguistic diaspora. Practically every family story, and God knows there were plenty of them, was a story about language. No, a story about languages. Never mind Lady's inert Judeo-Christian <clears throat> Judeo aristocrats who moved confidently between a couple of local dialects. The shtetl dwellers of my ancestry navigated five or six distinct tongues as a matter of daily life. No wonder that adult conversation could be conducted aslant several layers of childproofing camouflage, from English to Yiddish to Polish to God knows Ruthenian, depending on the ever advancing comprehension of greedy young listeners. I probably learned the slipperiness of languages at, at the same time as I acquired language itself. I learned secrecy and defiance from my first attempt at reading, circa age three, <clears throat> in a language my parents wouldn't countenance, courtesy of a Hebrew grammar book clandestinely furnished by my pious grandmother in defiance of the self-congratulatory secularism that ruled our house. What I didn't learn, however, was Hebrew, since she could transliterate only into Cyrillic. Eventually, the book was desiccated by its hiding place behind the playroom radiator so that it took on the qualities of some sacred and undecipherable parchment. <clears throat> um, before I knew any foreign languages that weren't among those spoken in the house, I knew there was a single set of sounds that in Spanish meant here is a table, and in Yiddish meant a cow eats without a knife. <laughs> Similarly, I knew that a slight vowel shift turned uh, voila into something Slavic for chicken waffles. <laughs> when necessity arose, my mother would teasingly chant a long set of rhymes uh, in Ukrainian that had the power to dissolve warts. I can still repeat it, though I do not know the meaning of a single word. <clears throat> Nowadays, this all seems stylish, even glamorous. But half a century ago, it was more shameful than chic. My family's brand of foreign migrated in one generation from gravely disabling to tediously bourgeois without ever passing through even a remote suburb of trendy. My parents were embarrassed because they were so different. In addition to that inheritance, I was embarrassed because I was so much the same. You could, of course, tell lies and try to pass. Alternatively, you could take command of these inhibiting mortifications and make reality itself swerve. Invent your life by lying, <clears throat> or invent your life by steering it in the vaguely apprehended direction of your own fantasies, or a little of both. When Saturday Night Live's immortal coneheads find that their hydrocephalic shape or mechanized speech is about to betray extraterrestrial origin, they prevent discovery by immediately droning, we are from France. <laughs> All suspicion dissolves at once in the face of an identity that also authorizes unlimited strangeness, uh, while also brandishing a sexy cachet. With scarcely more claim on this title than if I had myself come from planet Remulac, I spent my early years piecing together my own claim on France. A little bit was true, a larger bit was prevaricated, but the largest bit was my own hard work to absorb a culture I was scarcely born to. If I became a little French boy, then perhaps I could convert my family's citizenship retroactively. The work had to be covert so that the results would appear natural. 
Nasal vowels, irregular verbs, expressing 72 and 6012, these were easily mastered. <laughs> but they were only the beginning of a private life spent absorbing the food and music, the politics and poetry of France. Indeed, so early and so effective was this self-invention that as an adult, my falsehood has become a kind of truth. I can quite authentically look back on a childhood spent with Tantin, Camembert, and the Marseillaise. Then, linguistically, I went into deeper cover. With Hebrew foreclosed, I threw myself into Latin. Later, I reached German and puberty around the same time. <clears throat> I must have looked forward to both as thrillingly, catastrophically alien. Certainly, both horrified my parents. But after a childhood of Yiddish, the German part of these terrors, at least, proved surprisingly unfrightening, strangely Heimlich. In short, what enabled me to enter that language lab where I worked was the embrace of one culture that I had struggled to invent and another that I had mastered in spite of myself. <clears throat> what was the result was a tangle of interlanguages that put me perennially in the role of half-baked interpreter among foreign tongues and within myself. <laughs> that was the starting point from which I was now developing Italian. Not that all this uh, proficiency was just a question of Ukrainian war jingles and Mozartian flirtation. Learning a language, living a life, understanding a work of art, you can nail down the vocabulary, get used to the paradigms, even memorize a phrase book. <clears throat> but if you want to be more than a tourist, you have to figure out the underlying principles and speak your own speech. The fact is, my first real step in comprehending Don Giovanni's Italian, or especially speaking my own, probably came when I could finally wield the subjunctive, the kind of verb that instead of telling you what happens, teases you with what is anticipated, feared, hoped for, commanded, supplicated, or contrary to fact. The lessons came in handy with the arrival of a new person in my life. My rented apartment came with a cleaning lady, and she turned up fresh from arduous summer holiday travels a few weeks after I had settled in. Giovanna was cheerful, self-assured, olive-skinned, opulent of physique and personality, but she posed linguistic difficulties of her own. In the first place, her own speech veered between dialect and an Italian that deformed its consonants following patterns I could not immediately discern. <clears throat> in the second place, my Italian needed to rise to a certain level of gracious indirection, if I was not to appear to be ordering her around as though she were an indentured servant. It starts right away with you. So simple in English, where God and the devil, masters and slaves, the one and the many, can all be addressed alike. French and Don Giovanni had taught me that you all were somehow more polite than you want. But modern Italian went even further by calling every person, male or female, with whom one was on formal terms, she. Still, I could hardly say to Giovanna, she, clean under the refrigerator, <laughs> which is where the subjunctive came in. I'm sure I began badly with, let the underpants be bleached. <laughs> May every salad bowl be dried by hand. <laughs> but then I progressed to, it would please me with the hair to be removed from the shower drain, come what may. <laughs> then it developed, given the extraordinarily primitive electrical arrangements of the apartment, which Giovanna alone, of all people on the planet, understood, that she had a few contingencies of her own for me to chew on. If you didn't unplug the hot water heater before going into the bath, I learned, live current might get channeled through the shower head. <laughs> if you were to open the refrigerator while the vacuum was in use, a computer was liable to crash. The whole, the whole apartment operated on a vast grid of subjunctives. <laughs> Giovanna's life, as it turned out, was governed by far more dire hypotheticals than these, by life and death questions concerning Babylon, Armageddon, and the precise number of the anointed in the heavenly kingdom. I knew nothing of this at first. The closest I got was a series of rather confusing travel narratives. On her first visit to me, she had just returned from touring in a bus with, as I understood it, 16 of her siblings. When I asked exactly how big her family was, she looked at me with affectionate superiority and explained that they were spiritual brothers and sisters. <laughs> None of this would have added up to Jehovah's Witness without a much larger episode of misunderstanding. At Christmas, I gave her a handsome tea kettle, like one she had admired in the apartment. Uh, the following week, uh, scarcely pausing in her ritual of donning an all-over apron to cover quite elegant street clothes, she handed me a package. Only now did the penny drop. It was a book with no dust jacket, no author, no cover art, just block gilt lettering that read, in Italian simple enough even for me, life, how did it get here? 
an imprint from the Watchtower Society. <laughs> it's scientific, said Giovanni, perhaps catching a sign of alarm in my face. And it has beautiful pictures. I flipped through the heavily illustrated pages, images of apes and human craniums passing before my eyes as I wondered how to respond to the gift of an anti-evolution track that clearly represented Giovanna's deepest spiritual commitment. I can't quite explain what happened next, except on the grounds that I had fallen into some abyss of social and verbal confusion, the pandemonium of my life as an interlanguage. Of course I was going to tell lies. The only questions were, how many, how big, and how well would I do in a foreign language? <laughs> Perhaps it was the heritage of my self-invented childhood. If I was going to make up stories, they may as well have to do with family, history. I decided to say that a scientific book was the perfect gift because my father was a chemist. The truth is, my father wasn't a chemist. Not in the American sense, anyway. British was another language I had labored to master. He owned a drugstore. And perhaps it was this jagged leap that threw me back from my newly minted imperfect Italian to the more assured, if also fabricated, universe of my French. Whatever the reason, the words I carefully framed in my head were mon père faisait la chimie. And I proceeded to translate them uh, literally, or rather phonically, into Italian. Mio padre faceva la chimie. Unfortunately, what I had just said in Italian was, my father was a monkey. <laughs> After a moment of silence, <laughs> Giovanna smiled a little more guardedly than usual and said, In what sense? <laughs> I was on a roll, why stop inventing? In a laboratory, I replied. <laughs> we had many more conversations about it. Uh, Never about my family. <laughs> um, uh, everything changes when I join a wine tasting group uh, uh, and meet a great many people who form the center of the book. Especially one uh, intense friendship is developed with someone called Giorgio, who the first time I meet him at the first wine tasting said he's only interested in good, uh, in good food, good wine, good literature, and good sex. Um, uh, and he talks about his family and, and uh, his wife and, and, uh, and daughter and so on. Uh, and I'm going to read just a few things uh, that trace kind of the beginning and the end uh, uh, of, that, of that story. Um, a somewhat maligned destiny, at first anyway, attended upon efforts to be entertained at each other's homes. Uh, on one occasion, the phone rang, still a somewhat unusual event in the house, and it was Giorgio saying that potrebbe essere possibile that I could come to his house for dinner that very evening. The conditional was easier for me than the subjunctive, and more promising, I thought. <laughs> but scarcely had I set out in, in the direction of his house when whom should I see at the bus stop but uh, Giorgio, not at home where I was supposed to find him, but at the bus stop where I was going to begin my journey. He was wearing a completely new sort of stylish outfit, vaguely country, involving tattersalls and plaids. As I approached, he sent out signs of distress or embarrassment visible from afar. Scusa me, scusa me, something came up very complicated, so I decided to come here and wait for you. Uh, Sabina, Giulia, we'll talk about it later, he said. That expression, ne parleremo dopo, was to become almost a mantra of evasions and missed opportunities. On subsequent occasions, I often heard him music with his five-year-old daughter. But not to worry, we'll have a dolce together. With which he pulled me off to a cafe that featured enormous custard-filled pastries. Now, I didn't like being done out of my dinner, and I didn't want or want to be a cream puff. <laughs> but I was far from being able to negotiate the difference between my disappointment about dinner and my distaste for big sloppy sweet things. Suddenly, I was unleashing my refusal to eat a pastry in terms that were, doubtless, out of all proportion to the matter at hand. He stopped, held me at arm's length, looked into my face, paused, and read the scene. You don't like sweets. You know what your trouble is? Not enough mother love. <laughs> he was dead serious, doctorly, but also indulgently affectionate. Or too much, I replied. Ne parleremo dopo. He shrugged and let go of me. At my house the first time, all we managed was the opposite end of the meal. A Thursday afternoon, a spontaneous phone call. He is in my neighborhood with a bottle of wine. We will taste it together, and magari I'll make a little snack to go with it. Two necessary pieces of interlinear. First, Thursday afternoon, which was for me the nexus of all the unfathomable mysteries governing the Roman shopping schedule. Stores were shut down for about three hours in the middle of every day. 
They were also closed either Monday morning or Thursday afternoon, except in the warmer months when Saturday afternoon might be substituted for or added to the other closures. Food stores, however, had different schedules in regard to both the hours and days of operation. Outdoor markets were open only in the morning. Sunday, nothing was open. Second, the meaning of Magali, whose presence in conversation was almost as unpredictable as shop closure. It could be something quite innocent, like maybe even, or perhaps also. On the other hand, its etymological origins lay in the mysterious wills of divinities, such as the Magi. More to the point, used all by itself in response to a hypothetical assertion, it could mean either, if only, in a tone of fervent hopefulness, or in the negative, something more like, yeah, right. <laughs> Giorgio seemed to fit somewhere inside all those wide-open optative spaces. <laughs> now, at any rate, I needed to determine whether I could shop for food, so that I might possibly even, perhaps as well, produce an irresistible luncheon. No time to climb down the stairs and find stores closed, better to raid the pantry, such as it was. An insalata caprese was in prospect for the evening. While it was far too much of a cliché to propose in my maiden voyage with Giorgio's taste buds, some of its modules might be disassembled. I also had some leftover roasted eggplant slices and a few little half-red, half-green tomatoes that were uncannily lush and acidic at once. Yes, something could be managed. The greeting was warm and tactile. The Gewürztraminer from the German-speaking border territory was a suitably exotic mix of crisp and tropical. And for the first time, Giorgio offered bits of autobiography. He was a philosopher, but not at the university. When I asked what kind of philosophy he practiced and where, he free associated away from any specific responsibilities and narrated a long involvement with psychoanalysis. You know, Otto Rank, Erich Fromm, Wittgenstein, <laughs> this high-level name-dropping was not comfortable territory for either one of us, and I sensed it deteriorating as each citation was made. On the one hand, I felt inadequate to this roster of eminences. On the other, I was wondering what this man could possibly do for a living that would leave him so free to wander around Rome on a Thursday afternoon with an open bottle of wine. I brought out the snack, a platter with a perfect four square of toast points, each rubbed with a little olive oil and garlic each with a layer of roasted eggplant, a fine dice of tomatoes carefully de-seeded, a thin slice of buffalo mozzarella that had been passed briefly under the broiler, and finally a latticework grid of freshly chiffonaded basil, the small meat kind. It produced a gratifying expression of awe. Que bon gars, he said. What generosity. Taking note of the ingredients, he went on to give me good marks for originality within a familiar theme, for both surprise and aptness and interrelated flavors. A ruminative pause full of promise while we tasted food and wine together. A pleasurable murmur, a swallow, the dabbing of a napkin. Then a sharp turn in my direction, accompanied by an obliging smile. But excuse me, Basilico, it's out of season. He hunched his broad frame over the platter and proceeded to pluck the garnish off all four remaining crostini. <laughs> Fine, l last, I promise, last bit. <laughs> Which, come, <laughs> which comes uh, at the end of the long arc of our very wonderful, uh, fascinating, perverse relationship. Um, <clears throat> uh, skipping a great deal, the, the friendship grows uh, tense uh, in many ways. Uh, on one occasion, we go to the beach um, uh, many months later with his daughter, and in the course of conversation, I commit an unpardonable blunder. I patronize him uh, by complimenting him on how contented he he manages to be despite the fact that he has uh, not had great professional success. Oh. <laughs> it obviously tells more about me than, than about anything else yeah. that I would do that, but we won't go down that road. Uh, it's the next book. Um, <clears throat> so we, we find ourselves at this point at the beach uh, when the, the bomb has dropped. Leo, Leo, Leo. Georgia speaks my name in a tone part ironic and part operatic, then gets up and walks away. I didn't tell you this before, he says, when he's returned to his seat beside me. But you remember last week when you served us that big plate of pappardelle? Yes, I remember. Where is this head, I wonder? Those meatballs were so tough you couldn't chew them. Too much bread, too much egg, too much pepper. Sabina thought she had food poisoning. I nearly had to take her to the hospital. <coughs> Dio mio, is she all right? <laughs> I hope I am doing a good job of pretending I believe him. Uh, the slide from gastronomic dissatisfaction to toxicity seems highly suspicious. Non capisci un cazzo, he says with real anger. Roughly, you don't understand a fucking thing. He unleashes a tirade on his old theme of lasciarsi andare. Let yourself go. 
Um, all my accomplishments are just a screen, and they don't prevent me from being un cretino about love, un coglione about sex, un deficiente about companionship, un fesso about loneliness. <clears throat> Inspired by this lexicon, I fight back. Se mi manca qualcosa, if, if I'm missing something, what harm is it doing you? And I unload a few months' worth of resentments. Along the way, I find my own lexicon. Mascalzone disgraziato, filo tilo di puttana, testa di cazzo. I think of one of the standard family jokes. A mother, angry that her child is still playing outside when it's dinner time, shouts out the window, You dirty rotten goddamn, get back in here. The kid replies, You're a dirty rotten cat. The mother to herself, My God, where does she hear such language? <laughs> Giorgio's thinking is clearly on the same track. How the hell have you learned to be so vicious in Italian? <laughs> it is true, I have learned this. Don Giovanni served me well, finally, and Giorgio too. Now I hear how his wife, his child, his job, his prospects for advancement in the world of philosophy are suffering because he is spending time with me. I've had this conversation before, in other countries, in other languages. If I have learned anything, it is not to fight back on the ground that the married man has chosen. This is the moment, then, to turn the other cheek to tell him that this isn't about language lessons and viciousness, but the opposite. I want to say that he has taught me I could be lovable, I could be loved in Italian. But all I manage is, let's not finish it like this. My time with you has been the best part of my year in Italy. E stato, e stato, he repeats. You're right, the time is over. Tagliamo la corta. Let's cut the cord. How did we get from not finishing it to finishing it? And what exactly is finished? True, the afternoon at the beach is over. We're coaxing Julia out of the surf and wordlessly packing the car. But have I just declared that my year in Rome is over? Or is it my relationship with Giorgio whose cord has been cut? The perils of the verb. <clears throat> I meant to say has been. What I was forced to say was è stato. In English, what has been may still be going on. In Italian, if something è stato, it is completely finished. In fact, I had just been learning how many pasts the two languages have and how irreconcilable they are. When you get to be a quite advanced student of Italian, you may start wielding a tense called the passato rimoto, which includes strange, unexpected forms like fu and ebbe. Or you may find it in the earliest lines of the Divine Comedy, <coughs> where Virgil says, Omo già fui, poeta, fui. I was a man, I was a poet. Except not like was in English. What he's really saying is, I was and finished being a man. I was and finished being a poet. It's over. So this perfect tense, as they call it, because it refers to things that have been perfected, was teaching me about all sorts of pasts. When Dante has Virgil say, fui, it's because he wants to make it perfectly clear that Virgil, man and poet, is completely enclosed in the past. But it was my scholarly business to disenclose the past. I was stuck with a broader band of possibilities for past and present and possessed of later, looser, more hybrid languages to shape my thinking about it. Was, has been, used to be, era, e stato, fui. And whenever <clears throat> uh, I'm unhappy, I look at art, and this time it's the Sistine Chapel, precisely at the moment when the cleaning is half done, that I go to see. And this was really the last part. <coughs> Coming through the little door into the big space of the chapel, before I saw any art at all, I was confronted with masses of plywood, bright lights, and contrivances of scaffolding that resembled some hydraulic reconception of the structures that make painting the ceiling possible in the first place. Drawn by the remarkable colors on the ceiling at the end, I passed through the two-thirds of the space where the work was not yet done, or currently being done, as though it were so much static. My gaze landed first on a bald, bearded man with a book, wearing flaming pastels. I had never before seen Zacharias cast a shadow, since in the old days, everything was shadow. He had all the waiting presence of an animate being, and yet there was a darkness in his face. What before was all scuro was now chiaro scuro, a darkness that made him appear immobile, like an icon. Not so the two putti behind him, now revealed as a blonde and a brunette, whose shadings of rose and ivory made them seem more like flesh and blood. Framing all three were pairs of sculpted putti, not really sculpted, of course, but painted to look like sculpture, whose distinctness in hue and texture located them in yet another order of nature, or art. Fresco paint was everywhere being turned into architecture, sculpture, bodies, no veil of uniformity, but separate categories of being. Michelangelo seemed to assert the irrevocable boundaries of life and death, but also to place the human body on an infinitely shaded continuum between those extremes. The room was perfectly trisected on that Monday morning. First, a kaleidoscope of fresh color. Then, in the middle, the superstructure of contraptions behind which nothing was visible. 
and lastly, the unclean frescoes as we had known them all our lives. It took only the briefest glance at the restored images for me to shed any anxiety about the project. Clearly, this would be the Sistine Chapel, as Michelangelo had painted it, and it was even greater than we could have imagined. My fellow tourists now swarming in bunched themselves so disproportionately at the gleaming end of the room that if the chapel had really been Noah's Ark instead of a metaphor for Noah's Ark, we might have been on a sinking ship. <laughs> if only to avoid the crowd, I felt myself finally drawn from the far end to the center, the unseen center. As I stood under it, restorers were at work on the creation of Eve. The expulsion from the garden, its cleansing already completed, was partly obscured. The creation of Adam, also half-covered, was not yet begun. I was at the exact midpoint of space in the room and time of its renovation. Above my head, the most famous scenes were shrouded. To one side of me, the reborn clarity of the Noah scenes, which generally received so little attention. Uh, to the other side, the as yet untouched panels depicting the first days of creation, whose unrepresentability was fit fittingly served by the gray cloud inside which the old dirty Sistine ceiling seemed uniformly encompassed. As I planted myself in the blank epicenter and turned my torso like one of those athletic medallion wielders, first toward the light, then toward the darkness in which God said, let there be light, and then back again, I started to feel the layers of the past as though inside my own body. Was, has been, is, the days of creation, the years of fresh growing the Sistine ceiling, the centuries of its, of its afterlife. Michelangelo, uh, uh, no mechanical reproduction here, the real thing, Michelangelo in the flesh, Michelangelo made paint in the flesh, flesh decays, art decays, what was still is, but is different even when it is put back as it was. In the course of the next few days, there was one phone call that was friendly but cautious, and another in a tone of appeasement, with references to how painful, though necessary, our separation had been, how much he had missed me, <clears throat> how he now felt completely delivered from the problems that had started it. Between the two calls, he made yet more appearances on my doorstep, with tokens including a bunch of flowers, what century were we living in, and a bottle of 1978 Barolo that was extremely strenuous to consume at 11 a.m., the more so because it was accompanied by post-mortems aimed partly at resolution and, and partly at reawakening hostilities. We had dinner the next evening at a restaurant of my choosing, distinguished by its spaghetti with shellfish and its clientele of breathtaking long-haired soccer stars. Here, in contrast to the previous morning's conversation, nothing but small talk was spoken. <clears throat> until the evening was over, and we found ourselves huddled just outside the doorway of the shop. Senti, he began. Sabina and I want to take you with us to the sulfur baths in Saturnia. We'll soak ourselves in mud. We'll wash away all the bad humors together. Così ci salutiamo. You say goodbye, I say hello. Ci salutiamo could mean anything. It could mean anything from a casual greeting to an eternal farewell. It, <clears throat> it was difficult to know which to expect from Giorgio and Saturnia. It's true that the sense of an ending had already started to close in on me. Not a sad ending, not a happy ending, no simple dramatic genre suffices, but more like a period at the conclusion of a sentence. Better to think of my life as grammar than as theater. Thank you. <laughs>